So I could not have asked for a better lead-in for what I'm going to be talking about today. So we talked about how do you get your data into a graph shape? How do you have your knowledge graph? Now what I'm going to be talking about is once you have your knowledge graph, what do you do with that from a data science perspective to start generating new insights? And so I'm the senior data scientist at NEO. I sit on the analytics team. So we have both graph algorithms as well as uh, the Spark integration. So I'll be talking a little bit about both. And I think the like TLDR, if you don't want to listen to the rest of this presentation, earlier this week someone said to me, why should I care about this, Alicia? Like, you really like graphs, that's cool, whatever. Why do I care? Tell me in one sentence. And the one sentence, like the aphorism we fall back on is, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I think we all can think of examples of times this has really mattered in your life. So you really wanted a job. What was important was not where you went to school, what your degree was in, how many years of experience. It was, hey, your college roommate could recommend you to the hiring manager, right? So we've all had that experience that relationships can often be the strongest predictors of behavior. And that's a hand wavy example, but some real world examples are the single biggest predictor of whether or not you are a smoker is whether your friends and family smoke. If we talk about elections, do you know what the biggest predictor of whether you show up to vote is? It's whether your friends have voted and it's that peer pressure and why when you log into Facebook on election day, it says, click here to show you voted so that you know all the people you connected to are voting. So when we talk about why should I be using a graph and a model, it's because relationships can be really important predictors. And there's a lot of different ways to include those. So one thing I like to do is kind of level set on vocabulary when I talk. So I am a super technical data scientist. I use weird technical words for all different things. In this room, I bet we have 50 different words for the same five concepts. So to kind of frame everything today, when I talk about artificial intelligence, what I mean is when you have a computer process that is learned to solve tasks in a way that mimics human decisions. So this could be anything from a heuristic to deep learning. This is the most general kind of concept of we're using machines to make better decisions. Machine learning is a subset of AI. Machine learning is when you have an algorithm or a model that you can train to solve a specific task. So you train your model to solve this task, you give it some new data, it makes some predictions. Within machine learning, you have deep learning. This is a specific class of models using uh, neural networks, multiple hidden layers to make predictions um, with using gradient descent. And so we're going to be talking about kind of going from this broad AI all the way down to deep learning. And at NEO, you probably guys have if you've ever seen any other NEO slides before about this, you've probably seen these four pillars of AI. So you start with a knowledge graph. You need some data to do data science, right? That's a prerequisite. This gives you your context for your decisions. From there, you can kind of go into two directions. You have graph accelerated AI, which, are, which is basically you have your knowledge graph. It's really easy to pull out the relevant subgraphs or subsets of data from that graph to solve the problem you want to solve. So you don't want to throw the kitchen sink in. You want to say, ah, for this problem, I want this subgraph, and I want these connections. I want to build these features. Graphs make it easier to do this. On the more technical side, you have connected features, where basically you're looking at using the graphs to create new features that you can feed into your machine learning pipeline and make better predictions. And that's really going to be the focus of this talk. And then finally, and this is kind of future directions, you have graph native learning which is basically, we're gonna be talking about graph neural networks. And that is when you are learning natively within the graph, you have a graph as your input, you make predictions about changes in graph structure, and your output is an updated graph. So I've said a lot of words about data science, and I'm sure some of you guys are like, I don't care, do I even have a graph problem? So we've kind of called out eight potential use cases these are eight out of many. These are just ones that I've worked on in the past that are coming up pretty frequently. And I'm going to kind of give you a really high level overview of where graphs touch these different problems. So financial services is something that I've spent a lot of time on recently, working with our early adopters for graph algorithms, looking at how do you use kind of the inherent graph data when you look at finances, right? You have accounts who are making transactions with businesses. Those accounts have identifiers. There's a native graph there. And you can use information from that graph, who's connected to who, what are common flows and patterns to identify things like 
first party fraud or money laundering. And I will go into a lot of depth on that in about 20 minutes. Um, one thing that's kind of near and dear to my heart where I spent a lot of my career is drug discovery. So biology and chemistry are kind of inherently graphy. You have protein-protein interaction networks. You have chemicals as graphs. Um, one thing that's very you know, growing in popularity is if you think about um, graphs of genes, chemicals, and diseases, how do you find new treatments based on those interactions? Can you use link prediction or relational inference to develop new insights? Recommendations are something that has come up again and again. Neo4j has done a lot in the space of collaborative filtering, where I have a knowledge graph, and I basically have some rules about the recommendations I want to make, right? I want to recommend to you something that your friend liked. Building on top of that, you can start using algorithms like PageRank to find influential people you want to make recommendations on. You can use tools like modified community detection algorithms to find recommendations that form specific groups or projects. Or you can use sort of graph neural network approaches to actually predict novel paths based on graph structure. Customer segmentation is kind of more an example of that graph accelerated machine learning we talked about. So when we talk about customer segmentation, you know, in tabular data world, you're going to think about, I want to segment my customers based on their demographics. Show me all white college educated women between the ages of 25 and 40, and I'm going to market them this thing. When we talk about customer segmentation on a graph, you're segmenting your customers based on who do they interact with. And the people I interact with are probably going to be better predictors of my behavior than kind of a generic term. When we talk about cybersecurity, this is, there was a really cool recent paper by Fujitsu and Deep Tensor looking at if you have networks of interacting IP addresses, connect, identifying changes in that graph structure can identify intrusions into your network and possible security breaches. When we talk about churn prediction, you know, we say, you know, how do you retain customers? How long has this customer been with this company? How many times have they called tech support? One of the best predictors is actually, how many of your friends have left this network? And so Huawei recently published a paper where they looked at their internal data in China, and they said, what are the biggest predictors of someone leaving this mobile network? And what they found was that not only was it whether your friends had left, whether the people you call frequently, was also the page rank or how influential your friend who had left the network was. So when your friend who's always on the phone calls everyone all the time, leaves that network, they better worry about those people you were calling. Um, search and MDM is kind of where a lot of this got started. We take page rank for granted now, but I remember the days before Google when we used AltaVista. But you know, page rank is kind of this foundational algorithm of how do I traverse all this connected data, find what's important. Now we have a lot more ways of building on top of that to recommend the right search results, context-dependent, relevant information. And then finally, predictive maintenance. You want to talk about you have a network of interacting parts in some kind of system. You want to identify which parts should I be looking at? Where should I be preventing failure? So you could be looking at which parts are sort of connectors between different hubs? Which parts have sort of the highest connectivity? Which parts, if they fail, will cause a cascade across your graph? And you can use all the different kinds of graph algorithms to figure out what do I want to hone in on. The bottom line of all of this is I talked about eight different examples, but the concept behind them is the same. We're talking about making new and better predictions with data that you already have. We're just putting that data into a graph shape and then letting you get more information out of it. So your typical tabular data science model, you're going to have rows and columns and you're either ignoring network structure and relationships, or you're going to a lot of effort to pull those out where you have your column of how many friends does this person have. When your data is in a graph, it's much simpler to get those out and into your model. Graphs also can add really new predictive features based on graph algorithms, which are unsupervised features. Instead of me saying, I think this is important, I'm going to go find it and put it in, I can run something like uh, connected components and see which isolated subgraph is this individual in? Maybe that's predictive. And then finally, when you have graphs, you can start predicting things about relationships. So I think this is one thing that we sometimes overlook. We say, hey, you can make better predictions about financial crime because you know where money is flowing. But once you have graph data, you can start predicting things like who's going to interact with who. You have a network of interactions, and you can say, I want to predict who's at risk for joining a game, a gang. So I want to look at 
who of their friends are already involved in gangs and how influential are those friends in the network. So because you've got your data in a relational graph, you can start making new predictions about relationships. So there's a lot of exciting ways we can make use of this. And in case you're like, maybe this is just Neo4j making up stuff to market to me, um, it's not just us. So there was a really awesome paper from Google, MIT, and DeepMind that came out in November. Uh, it's, I think it's called like relational inductive biases on graphs. Um, I call it the DeepNet paper. But basically what they said is that graphs bring an ability to generalize about structure that no existing modeling framework gives you. So by using graphs, you can make better, more broadly applicable generalizations. And for people who spend their time reading these journals, this was like super exciting, game changer. But you get to the conclusion of the paper, and they say there's one lingering question. You know, this is the right framework. This is the algorithm to rule all algorithms. But where do the graphs come from that graph networks operate over? And I think this is a really nice, you know, why Neo4j? Because we put your graph data in a graph shape that lets you use these graph native algorithms. So it starts you off on the path to success. And now I've said a lot of words, and it's like, how do I actually do this, right? And so I like to see code. I'm not going to bore you with that, so I have some workflow models. Um, you want to talk about, how do I get started? So you start with your data sources. You pull those together. We can talk about Spark, CSV, SQL. You pull all that information into your native graph platform in Neo4j. Once you're in Neo4j, you can modify your graph architecture. You can do some feature engineering. And then you can pull that new data out and add it back to your tabular data and push that through to your normal machine learning pipeline. Because my team works with Spark Graph and Morpheus, uh, we have examples throughout this deck specifically talking about Spark. So in Spark, you have uh, your data frames using Spark Graph, which will be part of uh, Spark 3.0, we have rewritten graph frames to use our property graph model. You can take your data frame and you can map it to a graph structure. This lets you start to experiment and say, do I have a graph problem? What does my graph look like and what can I get out of it? In Spark, these graphs are immutable. This is also a projection where you're running a cipher query on something that's really mapped back to a table. So it's not as efficient as it could be, but it gets you started. Once you've figured out, hey, this is my graph shape, I have a graph problem, I've taken my 10 terabytes of data down to two, I'm ready to do some data science, you can use Morpheus to subset that graph into your relevant subgraph, move it into Neo4j, where you can store your graph in a persistent way that you can update, write to, and run your native graph algorithms, write your predictions, et cetera. From Neo4j, you can either move back into Spark and use MLlib to make predictions, or you can use some other package wherever you're comfortable. But sort of this workflow is Neo4j sits in the middle as a place where your data lives and where you can run graph native algorithms. And kind of conceptually here, what we're talking about is Spark is a really great place to explore and say, do I have a graph problem? It's really scalable. It can deal with large data quantities. It's very powerful for data pipelining. And what it gives you are non-persistent, non-native graphs. So we've had some people say, I tried this out, and my four hop query just choked. And so that's when you want to move to Neo4j, when you really want to build and persist. So once you're in Neo4j, you have persistent dynamic graphs. You have graph native queries and algorithms that are specifically designed to run on an in-memory graph. So things run more quickly. You can store your data. You can make modifications. And we have a constantly growing list of graph algorithms and embeddings that you can make use of. Putting it all together, so this is kind of intimidating, right? I'm like, you guys should all just get started data sciencing with graphs. Let's go. Where, how do I start? Sign me up. So the way I like to visit, visualize this is kind of the steps of graph data science. So on the x-axis, we have enterprise maturity. And this is kind of inverse. So on the left-hand side, you have kind of the most mature. You've got knowledge graphs. Neo4j has been doing knowledge graphs since 2012 for a long time. Moving over to the right, you have kind of things that we've developed, things that are in experimentation and where we want to go in the future. So we have query-based feature engineering. We have graph algorithm feature engineering. 
we have experimental graph embeddings, and we're moving towards graph neural networks. On the y-axis, you have kind of data science complexity. So you're like, how do I get started? The easy place to start is with your knowledge graph. Once you have your knowledge graph, you can incrementally build on it and at each step add value. And so what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is we're going to talk about each step and go through a real world use case where someone has done something in this space, made predictions, and used Neo4j. So starting off with query-based knowledge graphs, we're not going to spend a long time on this because we've had a whole morning about how awesome knowledge graphs are. But I think we kind of undersell them, right? A knowledge graph lets you answer the questions that you know you have the answers to, you just couldn't get the answers out before. So a really nice example is the Refinitive dashboard, uh, which is made for Thomson Reuters, and it's in Neo4j. And what they did is they made a knowledge graph connecting data sources across lots of different siloed data sets. So they have corporate data about which companies interact with each other and how. So this company has a contract with this other company. This company is a supplier. This company has invested in this other company. They have additional data about external news. So what articles were published about this company in the last week? Is there something happening in the press that we want to be concerned about, good news or bad news? And then on top of that, they have customized weighting that they've put in when they've built their knowledge graph. And this is kind of intimidating, right? You've seen Browser, you've seen Bloom. What if you're just an analyst and you kind of want to, you know the canned queries you want to use? What we've built for them is a dashboard where they can look at the knowledge graph and kind of get the information out that they expect to get. So an analyst might look at 200 companies. They can pull up a dashboard for those companies and use pre-executed queries to look at things like credit risk. So are there, have companies associated with my company of interest had financial trouble lately? Have companies, uh, have there been bad news articles about my company or have there been good news articles? So you can kind of quickly pull together the information you know is out there kind of at one touch because it's unified in a single data source. So once you've got that knowledge graph, you can start doing even cooler things. So that was, I just, I know this information is in there, I wanna get it out. This is query-based feature engineering where you know some information in your graph is relevant to a prediction you want to make. So you're a domain expert, you have your knowledge graph, and you have a model you want to build. Let's talk about financial crime. So I want to predict whether an account holder is likely to commit fraud. Maybe in my model I want to put in something like, how many, how many accounts have they interacted with that have already been labeled for fraud within one hop, two hops, or three hops of the knowledge graph? And all I'm doing is I'm saying, I know something about this problem, and I can use the graph to get that relationship data back out. A really cool example that I love about basically domain-based feature engineering is something called HetNet or Hetionet. Um, this is online at het.io. Everyone should check it out. It's a knowledge graph that integrates over 50 years of biomedical data looking at genes, compounds or drugs, diseases, and kind of biological processes like tissues, symptoms, side effects, all into a single knowledge graph. And what they use this knowledge graph for is predicting new uses for drugs that are already on the market or drug repurposing. And so the idea is, what if there's a drug that is approved for this disease, but it would actually be relevant to treat this other disease, maybe because it's targeting the same genes? And so the way this works is here's kind of a subgraph around multiple sclerosis. So you can see in this example, it might be a little hard to read depending on where you're sitting. Multiple sclerosis is in brown. The gene IRF1 is in blue. We want to know if the gene IRF1 is actually relevant for multiple sclerosis. And you can see there's no direct connection, but you can see some multi-hop connections in the graph. What they do is they use queries to develop some features based on those graph traversals. So they look in and they say, for IRF1 and multiple sclerosis, how can I connect the two? What are the different ways I can get between them? So they found two ways for that toy example. IRF1 is connected via leukocytes to multiple sclerosis, and there's three potential gene traversals to multiple sclerosis via different genes. And for each of these potential metapaths, they have weights based on kind of domain expertise of how much do I trust this, how many data sources reinforce this idea, and they come up with metapath scores. So 
given the number of paths between this gene of interest and this disease, and how, how long those paths are, how much we trust those paths, you get a probability score that then they can plug into a link prediction model. So this is really powerful if you have a subject matter expert who knows the data and who knows what they're after. And this is a really good way of pulling in relevant information about relationships and putting it into what would previously be kind of a standard tabular prediction model. The kind of limitations there are you really need to know what you're after, right? I have said, I think this is relevant. No one is coming up with new ideas. So the next chunk we're gonna talk about is graph algorithm feature engineering, which is unsupervised instead. So if you want to do this, we're back to that. How do you get started in Spark? Again, you can merge all your data together. You can create your relevant subgraph. You push it into Neo4j, and that's where you're building these queries of how many hops between A and B, and how do I weight them? Or what do I think is relevant, and how do I aggregate that information to come up with some kind of metric that I'm going to push into my machine learning model? So it's not as intimidating as it sounds. Once we're comfortable with this, um, you can move into graph algorithm feature engineering. And so the pivot point here is instead of saying, I think this is relevant, we have different categories of algorithms that tell you different features about the topology or connectivity of your graph. And so what we're talking about here is feature engineering where you're just adding new, more meaningful features. And we're not saying to throw out what you already have. We're saying take your graph and move that data into new columns. So this is a toy example. It is Game of Thrones. Again, of course, why not? It's really pretty to look at. Um, you have a graph of who interacts with who and what is their page rank and how many people do they interact with and communities they've been assigned to. And I have my toy little Excel uh, ta table, I guess, because we all sometimes use Excel for our models. And I have my tabular data where I have you know, how old is everyone? What house do they belong to? What's their gender? Are they alive or dead? To that model, you can enrich it, adding, what's the page rank of this individual? How influential are they? How many people are they connected with? What community do they belong to? And you start to add new features that are probably much more predictive than how old someone is, right? So this is just taking the data you have, reshaping it, and making it more informative. When we talk about graph features, there's sort of six categories. And embeddings we're going to talk about last because they're a little bit different. We start with community detection. And this is basically clustering or partitioning your graph into groups of individuals or nodes that interact more frequently with each other than other groups. And so in tabular data, you might think about you know, doing k-means based on various metadata for your entities. This is clustering uh, nodes in your graph based on who they interact with, not what their attributes are. We have centrality and importance algorithms, which basically tell you how important or how connected a node is in the graph. And this is where page rank fits in. We have pathfinding and search algorithms. And these are basically, how do you find the shortest path, the least cost path, the best path between a node and a source? And where this comes into machine learning is back to that example of fraud, maybe I want to say, what's the shortest path between me and a fraudulent account? And maybe that's going to be a predictive feature. We have heuristic link prediction. And I, I really want to call out, this is link prediction based on the likelihood of a relationship being formed based on nodes in common. We have several uh, presentations out there you've probably encountered, or if you've read our graph algorithms book, uh, machine learning for link prediction using classifier models. What's built into our graph algorithms library is sort of rule-based link prediction. So how many neighbors do two nodes share tells you how likely they are to be connected. We have similarity algorithms, which basically tell you, based on what nodes are connected to, how similar are two nodes. So are they connected to the same or different things? And you come up with a similarity score. And then kind of on the, on the bleeding edge of our algorithms, we have embeddings. And these are learned representations of the connectivity or topology of the graph. They're de designed for certain use cases. And we'll talk about those later, but they're experimental right now. So one use case for using graph algorithms to create features is in financial crime. The reason that we focused a lot on this is large financial institutions already have existing pipelines to identify fraud, either a heuristic where if you violate these four rules, I'm going to flag your account, and someone is going to review it. Or models, you know, here's a classifier model. 
if this model predicts this is likely to be a fraudulent transaction, it's not going to go through. So this already exists, and this is our sweet spot of we want to use graph algorithms to add features that give you more accuracy. And I'm currently working on a number of different projects in this space, um, looking at different kinds of fraud and financial crime. So I kind of pulled out relevant algorithms for different use cases to give you a sense of what can I do here. So you could look at something like connected components, which finds disjointed subgraphs in your knowledge graph to identify things with shared identifiers. So if you're talking about first person fraud where you have a real identity, and you're daisy chaining synthetic identities off of that real identity. And maybe they're sharing something like an IP address or an address or a social security number. When you use connected components, you find these clusters where everyone is sharing common identifiers, and you can prioritize large clusters to review for fraud. Or you can use the size of those clusters as a predictive element in your modeling pipeline. We can talk about page rank, which measures influence um, and transaction volumes. So this is if you run page rank on a transactional graph. So you have different accounts making transactions with each other. You use the volume of the, the transaction size and the transaction frequency as your weights. You assign page ranks to nodes in your graph. The higher your page rank, kind of the more money and transactions are flowing through that node. And some of those are going to be spurious. Maybe it's Fidelity Bank, right? That's not a problem. But sometimes those are going to identify problematic nodes, either individuals committing fraud with high volumes of money, or you know, it could be something you want to flag because they are the center of a fraud ring. You can use something like Louvain to identify communities that frequently interact with each other. So the main application we've seen of this is if you want to find money laundering rings. So if you look at transactions as connections between accounts, Louvain will identify clusters in your graph where money is frequently moving between those clusters versus across the rest of your graph. If you seed those clusters with known criminals or use it in a machine learning pipeline, you can identify communities where there is money flowing between different accounts in order to obfuscate the source. And finally, we've looked at Jacquard, which is a similarity measure, where if you have a known fraudulent account, you can take another account and say, how similar are these two accounts? Are they interacting with the same individuals? Do I think that this account that is unlabeled is fraudulent? And this is not something like that I thought of or that Neo4j thought of. If you look at Google Patents and you type in graph fraud or anomaly detection, there are 48,000 US patents in the last 10 years. And these are big companies like IBM, Intel, Cisco. Um, uh, Palantir has a bunch of them. So this is a hot area of research and something where graphs really make it much more tractable to predict what's going on. The relationship structures are really predictive. So going back to how do I do this? So again, we start with Spark to bring our data together. And the difference is now, once we're in Neo4j, we run those graph native algorithms to start pulling out features that we're going to add as new columns to our tables. And so depending on your use case, you're going to run a different set of algorithms, pull those out, and then those go into your machine learning pipeline. In terms of what graph algorithms do we offer, um, we have a lot of them. I think it's 45 and counting in those five broad categories. Um, if you're kind of doing this explore in Spark, build in Neo, there are seven graph algorithms you can run in Spark. Um, and they're a great way to kind of get started and say, what does this look like? And then when you really want to kind of build out and say, I actually want to run a couple different algorithms and then use variable selection to see which one is most predictive. That's when you come to Neo and you can start having all the fun. Do you have a question? Yeah. So the question was, um, they're using Spark to build their graph right now. And how, how do we recommend doing that? And is that the right thing to do, right? So what we have is in Spark 3.0, they've rewritten uh, Spark Graph and the graph frames using the Neo4j property graph model. Um, you'll also have Cypher 9, which will enable you to run Cypher queries against those graph frames. These are a projection um, that basically maps your table into a graph shape, but your query is still against the underlying table. So we really position this as, I have 10 terabytes of data. I want to make it into a graph shape. Now I want to subset it into the relevant graph. And when you start doing heavy queries, um, you run into some performance issues, and that's when you want to move into Neo4j. And we have a tool called Morpheus, 
Um, please talk to me afterwards if this is exciting. I work on this team. And Morpheus is what lets you take your, your graph and you can create subgraphs from it and then move those into Neo4j natively. And so I'm super happy to talk about this. Um, I'm a little crunched on time and I think people want to have lunch. But so moving on to graph embedding. So I love graph embeddings because they're this sweet spot between feature engineering and deep learning. And so everyone's like, oh, we should do deep learning. And I think graph embeddings are really the nice place to get started because you can use an embedding either as a feature in your traditional machine learning pipeline where you've generated this embedding and you treat it just like any other categorical variable. You can use graph embeddings to look at similarity where you can compare two embeddings using like Euclidean distance and see how similar are these nodes. Or you can use your embeddings as your input into your graph neural network. So they're kind of this nice transition point. And we actually just brought someone onto my team to be developing graph embeddings for us. And in case I got really excited and talked about graph embeddings and you were like, that's cool, what on earth is that? Stepping back, an embedding is basically how you take some complex data and transform it into a vector. So probably you guys are familiar with something like word to vec um, where you take some text and you want to transform that into a bit string. A graph embedding transforms some aspect of the graph into a vector or set of vectors that describes the topology, connectivity, or attributes of nodes or edges in the graph. And different embeddings serve different purposes. So you wouldn't kind of have one universal embedding to rule them all. Um, generally speaking, you can have vertex embeddings, which describe the connectivity of a node. So if you've ever seen graph sage, it's a vertex embedding. Um, you can have path embeddings, which is the example I'm going to walk through for recommendations, where you have traversals across the graph and you translate those into bit strings. And then you can have a graph embedding where you encode your entire graph as a vector. And this is when you have multiple graphs that you're making predictions about, which is relevant kind of in the chemistry space. And so at the bottom of this slide, we have a figure from DeepWalk, um, which was one of the first and kind of most influential graph embedding papers to be published. And the way they create their embeddings is you take a node in your graph, you do multiple random walks across your graph from that node, and then you take each of those random walks, just like you would in word to vec and you create a skipgram model. So you look at co-occurrence, and then you can use that to learn weights using gradient descent of how influential, how much should I weight the presence or absence of this node in the path. So you take your graph, you take this kind of amorphous connected data structure, and you transform it into a bit string, which is much easier to work with in machine learning. So one example that I really love that was published about a year ago is eBay's paper, Explainable Reasoning Over Knowledge Graphs for Recommendation. We all want to use knowledge graphs for recommendation, and we always talk about collaborative filtering. But it, that, that's kind of what we can do now. What can we do in the future? How can we predict new applications, new unseen paths in the graph? And so what eBay's paper did is they kind of looked at the idea of how do you recommend a song to someone? And so Alex or Alice likes The Shape of You by Ed Sheeran. How do we identify new songs she might like? Well, luckily, The Shape of You sits inside a knowledge graph that connects all of this other data about Alice and The Shape of You. So Shape of You is sung by Ed Sheeran, who sings some other songs. The genre of that song is pop. Someone named Tony has also listened to this song, and he's listened to I See Fire as well. So you have all of this connected data that lives around this kind of source of Alice and the target of what song she likes. And you can actually traverse this graph to create embeddings to make better predictions. And so what that looks like is this paper took uh, what I would call a path embedding, where you take, they extracted every potential path up to six hops in the knowledge graph between the source and target node. And they looked at what were the nodes traversed, so Alice, Shape of You, Ed Sheeran, I See Fire, and what were the uh, relationships traversed, so interacts, sung by, produced, contains, right? So you have kind of two sets of information. You have all of these paths up to six hops. And then you take each of those, each of those individual paths, you create an embedding for those paths, and then you use an LSTM model to pull those and come up with a single path embedding that says, this is what the traversal between Alice and a song she likes looks like. And then you can use those embeddings in a deep learning model to say, well, what, what would Tony like? Here's how Tony is connected in the graph. And make a prediction based on path embeddings 
about what someone is supposed to like next. And what's really powerful about this example is these embeddings are interpretable. So you can use a decoder and you can make a prediction and say, OK, I think Tony is going to like Taylor Swift's me. And you'll say, well, why? And you can decode that embedding and come up with the probabilities that you traverse to come up with that new prediction. So it's moving away from this black box model of deep learning into something that's a little more interpretable. So I think this is super exciting. If this is something you want to get started with, our labs team has implemented two prototype embeddings. We have DeepWalk and DeepGL. These are experimental, not supported, but cool to play around with. Uh, we've just brought on someone for this summer. He's actually the PhD student of Steve Skyna, who came up with DeepWalk. And we're going to be spending the next few months kind of doing a review of relevant embeddings, figuring out where we go next. So if embeddings sound exciting, come talk to me. And so kind of the holy grail of graph data science at the end of our ladder is graph neural networks. And there's a lot of hype about this, but not a lot of understanding of what we're talking about. So when we talk about deep learning, this is training multi-layer neural networks using gradient descent. You might have seen RNNs, or recurrent neural networks, and CNNs, which are conv convolutional neural networks. RNNs are used on sequential data. CNNs are often used on images, where you have a matrix. The idea of a graph neural network is you have a more generalizable structure. So the definition that the DeepNet paper put forward is that graph native learning is a deep learning model that takes a graph as an input, performs computations on that graph, you update your graph, and then you return a graph as your output. And so kind of the figure underneath walks you through that. So you have an edge in your graph, you update it. The update of that edge changed the property of a node. And then once that has happened, you update the state of your graph. And this is a little hard to wrap your head around, but you can think of it like going back to, how do I know who smokes? So we have a graph of people who interact. And you want to know, do the majority of people in this population smoke? And is that going to change over time? And you could start with doing link prediction. Who knows who? So we start with an edge update. Joe becomes friends with John. Joe is a non-smoker. John is a smoker. So we've added a new edge. Now we want to update the John node to say, now that John knows one more non-smoker, is he still a smoker? And we say, no, nope, nothing changed in our graph. Then we repeat this. This is iterative. So now we have a relationship between John and Mary. John becomes friends with Mary. Mary is also a non-smoker. So we've done an edge update and then a node update. So now that John knows two non-smokers, maybe he's like, I'm tired of standing outside by myself. I'm done. So now we can update the status of our total graph. And we say, OK, now the fraction of this graph that are smokers is one smaller. So that's kind of a toy problem to help you wrap around what on earth is she talking about. Moving on to a real world problem, kind of the most advanced use of graph native learning that we see is really in the chemical space. So you can represent any chemical as a connected graph. The atoms in your molecule are, edge, are nodes in your graph. The bonds are relationships. There's a lot of research into how do you encode those as vectors. What you can do is you can represent each molecule as a graph. You can take a data set of molecules and reagents where you know what they form. And you can train an embedding in a neural network model to predict, given two new chemicals and a reagent, what are they going to make? And so there's kind of two outputs from this paper. Product prediction, so you take two input chemicals and a reagent. What do they form? And because this is a graph neural network where you are updating your graph iteratively, you can answer the question of how was it formed. Remember we talked about node and edge updates and then global state. So this is kind of cool in that it's really transparent. And if you're like, how does this work? Kind of here's a walkthrough. You start with your two molecules. You identify a node in your molecule that is likely to be updated. And then when you find that node, you say, are the relationships around that node going to change? And then you say, once that's changed, is the molecule stable, or do we keep going? And then you update changing those nodes and the bonds in your molecule until you reach something stable. And then you not only have your new product, you have the steps in between. So this is the reason I'm citing this is this is kind of an in-production example of graph native learning. And what's super cool is I actually know one of the authors of this paper. I was talking to him last week, and he was like, I'm really excited to try to get this running in Neo4j. So this is close to my heart. I think it's super awesome. I love talking about graph-native learning. So going back to progressing in graph data science. 
the take home message here is it's not hard to get started. Once you have your data in a graph, the barrier for entry is low. There is value to be gained at each step. You can use domain expertise and Cypher to come up with relative, really relevant expertise-driven features that you can put in your model. Building on that, you can run graph algorithms to create unsupervised features that tell you about the topology. Becoming more sophisticated, you can train graph embeddings using supervised uh, embedding models to tell you relevant features of your graph in generalizable ways. And then ultimately, you know, our end goal is enabling graph neural networks. This is kind of where we're heading, but the steps along the way, each one shows value. And depending on what you're doing, you may not want to go beyond graph-based uh, feature engineering, right? That might meet your model. So the goal here is it's not that hard to do. It's awesome to get started. And I'm really excited about it. So if you have any questions, we do have a graph algorithms book, which we have told you about many times. You should go download it. It's super awesome. Um, there's online materials uh, and also websites where you can kind of play around with stuff. And feel free to reach out to me, Alicia Frame, or bother me on Twitter or in person at lunch. Thank you.